Before we uh, begin looking at God's Word, I'd like to give a special welcome to those who are joining us, uh, junior hires, uh, for the first time today. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so today we're going to continue in our series of um, our series, The Way of Love, um, but uh, we're, we're coming towards the end. And actually, um, there will only be two more messages, just today's message and next week's message, and we'll be through with the series. Um, and um, today, I'd like to speak to you on the topic, Love Never Fails. And um, the last two messages of this series will have the same topic, uh, but there'll be part one and part two. And today, um, the, it will be taken from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. So look with me at God's word as I read. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together, Lord, to worship you. And Father, as we come before you, and I pray that you would take hold of our hearts, take hold of our minds, Lord, direct them to your word, direct them to yourself, Lord, that we would truly worship you in spirit and in truth. And we just pray that, you're, that the Holy Spirit would be in complete control, Lord, from beginning to end. And Lord, that we would not only uh, be able to hear the word, but that we would also be able to heed the word. All to your glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we come to the end of our series on the way of love, um, we have seen in verses 1 to 3 of this chapter uh, the absolute importance of love. Uh, we have seen what love is. We have seen that love is patient, that love is kind. We have seen what love is not, uh, that it is not envious, it is not boastful, proud, rude, self-seeking, easily angered. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And we have looked at the always of love, that love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And although we have stressed that each of these qualities of love are, are expressed, are ultimately expressed perfectly by God, we have primarily emphasized that these are qualities that we are to strive to express, of course, by God's grace, to express more and more in our lives. For this was a key emphasis of Paul when he gave them these qualities of love, as we have seen in 1 Corinthians 13. As I have mentioned a number of times during this series, 1 Corinthians 13 is not to be taken as a poetic discourse on love, but rather it is a call to action. Paul was actually pointing out where the love of the believers in Corinth had failed, not only toward God, but also toward one another. And today, we begin to end this series by focusing on what Paul wants the believers in Corinth and us to focus on, which is the origin or the fountainhead of love, which is God himself. As our chairman mentioned earlier this morning, 
As it says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Our love for God, our love for others, is only in response to God's love for us. In other words, God is the one who is the initiator of love. And our love is just in response to that. And in these last two messages, we will be focusing on the fact that love never fails. Now, perhaps when we hear the phrase, love never fails, it is difficult for us to accept because in our mind, what on this earth is unfailing? What on this earth never ends? Which is really what love never fails means, that love never ends. It's eternal. What on this earth can we truly depend on? Actually, nothing. The Bible tells us that we live in a fallen world where God's curse is already now on his creation because of sin that entered the world through Adam's disobedience to God. And now we are all born sinners where we daily disobey God and daily rebel against him. The Bible tells us in Romans 5.12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. So as a result, we cannot depend upon our health. We cannot depend upon even our life for they can fail us at any time. James 4.14 says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I don't know about you, but just it seems like as you read through the news, more and more you just hear of people, even young people, even in their 20s, even fitness influencers just dropping dead, you know, for whatever reason. It's just, um, you know, do we really know how long we have to live? What is your life? You are a mist, a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We also cannot depend upon our possessions. We cannot depend upon that car that breaks down, the house that wears out and deteriorates the money, the savings, that the investments that can be here today and gone tomorrow. So Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And it says in Proverbs 23, 5, cast but a glance at riches and they are gone for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. What we have for money, savings, investments can be here today and gone tomorrow. We also cannot depend on earthly relationships. Perhaps we get married, we build a life together, and then one is taken away because of sickness. Or, God forbid, one is unfaithful. And the one that you love and the one that you thought loved you fails you. And in some way, I think we have probably all experienced the failure of love in our life in some way, shape, or form, including experiencing regularly our own lack of love toward others. Examples in our own lives as we think about it where our love has repeatedly failed toward others and toward God. But our passage today says that love never fails. How can that be? It can only be true because Paul is addressing in today's passage the love of God that never fails. 
So love never fails means that, as I mentioned before, that love lasts forever, that it never ends. A love that will never fail you, that you can always depend on. And no one on earth has this type of love, even though we may hear people who claim that they do. Oh, I will love you forever and a day. But the Bible says Proverbs, in, in, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 6, many a man claims to have unfailing love, but a faithful man, who can find? No human being is able to have an unfailing love because there is no person on earth who is 100% faithful. Someone who will always stand by you, who will never leave you, who will never let you down to the very end, no matter what. And you can add to that the need for unfailing love, a love that never ends, the need for an unfailing love to also be eternal as well as unchanging. And these attributes needed in order to have an unfailing love can only apply to God. Only God is perfectly faithful. Only God is eternal. Only God is unchanging. We see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, that God is perfectly faithful to his children. In 2 Timothy 2, 13, it says, if we are faithless, meaning toward God, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Even those times when we are unfaithful toward God or even faithless towards God, he remains faithful to us because that is who he is. He is faithful and he cannot deny himself. That is who he is. We see that he is also eternal. In Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. This tells us that God is eternal. It tells us that in the beginning, God is already present. From the beginning, God is already existent. Who created God? No, no one created God. God has always existed. I can't, I don't get it. You know, I can't wrap this around, I can't wrap my head around this. You can't because our mind is limited. But suffice it to say that the fact that we see something today, it has to have a beginning. There has to be, it has to start with something. It cannot start from nothing because out from nothing, nothing comes. So God has always existed. In the beginning, God. And, and this is why he describes himself, God describes himself in Exodus chapter 3, 14 as the I am. Not I was or I will be, I am. That means I'm always existing, constantly, past, present, future. In Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's the name of God, I am. That means I always exist. I have always existed. I exist now and I will continue to exist. I'm always referred to in the present. And we see that Jesus himself used this same name for himself in John 8, verses 56 to 59, especially verse 58, where Jesus was talking to primarily the Pharisees here, people who rejected him when he was on earth. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. That means my coming to earth. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Abraham was born 
years before Jesus came to earth. And he had died years, many years before Jesus came to earth. And Jesus responded to them. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds because it was not yet his time to die. But he said, he used this word, this wording for himself, the name I am, in the same way that Jehovah God used in Exodus 3.14. That's why they picked up stones to stone him, because they, they said that he was blaspheming. He was claiming to be God. Of course he was claiming to be God, because he is God come in the flesh. But they didn't, they didn't want to accept that. But Jesus says, I am the I am. We see also that God is unchanging, immutable. In Malachi 3.6, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. I don't change. I promise that, that to keep this covenant with these people, and even though you have failed me, you have rebelled against me, I keep my promise because I do not change. And we see this also with Jesus in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus does not change. So why can there be an unfailing love? Why can love be eternal? Because God is love, and God is unfailing. God is eternal. God is unchanging. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And next time, we will look at this a little more closely. But we see here that God is love. Love is an attribute of God. An attribute of God is what God is. And because God is perfect, he is perfect in all his attributes. He's perfect in love. He's perfect in holiness, perfect in justice, perfect in mercy, perfect in grace. And the list goes on. And all God's attributes together make up God's glory, the glory of God. And if you think about it, we are not perfect in any of the attributes that God has. This is why the Bible says that we fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of God in his perfection, in his glory. We fall short because we sin. Whenever we are not loving to God and to others, we fall short. Whenever we are not living a holy life, we fall short. Whenever we are not just, not merciful, not gracious, we fall short of his glory. And in order for us to be accepted by God, this perfect, holy, and loving God, we have to be perfect ourselves, but there's no way for us to be perfect. But God has given us a way that we are able to be perfect in his eyes. And that way is only by grace through faith in Christ alone. And God's unfailing love is a theme that we see throughout the Bible. We see it in the psalmists. 
we see in Psalm chapter 13, verse 5. This is actually a Psalm of David. David was someone who was so close to God, so devoted to God, so wholehearted toward God. He was called the man after God's own heart. Is that the desire of your life, brothers and sisters? Brother, do you desire to be a man after God's own heart? Do you desire for you, sisters, do you desire to be a woman after God's own heart? David was called the man after God's own heart by God himself. It wasn't a name he was given by someone. In Psalm chapter 13, verse 5, David says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. And as you, as you look at this, and you just look at this verse, it's kind of like, okay, J David's making a statement here. Okay, He trusts in his unfailing love. I trust in God's unfailing love. But do you know the context? Do you know the situation, the conditions under which he says this? I think that's very important. We have to look at the context, which is actually a few verses before that in Psalm 13, 1 and 2. This is a time in David's life where he is under extreme sorrow. He is under extreme oppression uh, by his enemies, and, and he even has doubts going on in his head about, God, have you forgotten me? God, do you, do you really love me? He says in Psalm 13, 1 and 2, which is a Psalm of David, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This is how he was feeling at that moment. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And this is the context of Psalm 13, 5, where David comforts himself. He reassures himself with what he believes is true because he knew God so well. He says in 13, 5, but I trust even though I have all these things going on in my life, even though my mind is just, I'm going through mental struggles, physical struggles, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation because these are certainties in my life. These are things that I have experienced time and again in my life. And therefore, I hold on to these truths. In Psalm 31, verse 16, also of David, he says, let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. The psalmist says in Psalm 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. His love is an unfailing love. So we see this in the psalmist, just giving you a few examples. We see the, the theme of the unfailing love of God also in the book of Hosea. For those of you who know about the account of the prophet Hosea and the book of Hosea in the Bible, you would know that God tells the prophet Hosea to marry an adulterous woman, a woman by the name of Gomer, in order to provide a living illustration of how the Israelites had been repeatedly unfaithful to God in their chasing after other gods, worshiping other gods. And so Hosea, in obedience to the Lord's command, married this adulterous woman, this living object lesson that became his life. And, and we, we see in the Bible that, that there were three children that was born in their marriage, but each of these three children were born out of unfaithfulness 
They were born. She was, she, she bore children from, from other men, not Hosea. And there came a time where Hosea's wife, her lovers, abandoned her and sold her to the slave market. And it seems that Hosea, at that point, was out of love for her. He was only human, but not the Lord's unfailing love. And he told Hosea in Hosea 3, verses 1, and 1 to 3, the Lord said to me, it, with his wife in this type of situation, sold to the slave market. I don't know what, was he, he, what he was thinking in his mind. Maybe he was thinking at that point, you know, she made her bed, let her sleep in it now. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turned to other gods and loved the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will live with you. The fact that Hosea had to be told by God to do this for his wife means that Hosea's love had already been exhausted for Gomer. But God's love had not been. And the act of Hosea buying back his wife from the slave market also gives us a beautiful picture of how one day, which at that time was yet future, but has now happened. Jesus would purchase for himself all who believe in him, not with money, but with his own blood in dying on the cross for our sins and being raised for our justification. In the book of Hosea, we see God's unfailing redemptive love for sinners as we all are. That's why 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He had no blemish or defect. Jesus was without sin. There was no deceit in his mouth because there was no deceit in his heart. But that's also why it had to be Jesus. So that he could bear our sins in his own body on the cross and die on the cross for our sins even though he didn't deserve it. And because of him, we are now righteous in the sight of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, But God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We see also God's unfailing love in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, where Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These verses remind us that there is absolutely nothing that will ever separate us or can separate us from the love of God. There is nothing in our life, not even death, can separate us. 
which is just a doorway into the arms of Christ. For the believer, it is as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, away from the body and at home with the Lord. I've conducted a lot of memorial services, most of them for believers. And even though you know, people are saddened, I am saddened by the person that, of, the, of the loss of life that has just occurred, but at the same time, I'm joyful. At the same time, I, I love to say with assurance that, you know, they're no longer here, but they're now with Jesus, apart from the body, apart from the body, together with the Lord. However, I have conducted a few memorial services of people who it was not clear that they had received Jesus. And those are some of the most difficult services that I've conducted. It's the most difficult for me to do because they had not obviously received Christ. Uh, what it seemed to be obvious was, was that they had rejected Christ until they died. And, and it's the most difficult. All I can say, there is no assurance of anything. All I can say is, if this person, if this girl, if this man, this woman, if this man or girl or boy had received Christ before they died at any point, they will be with Christ in heaven. But one thing that needs to be emphasized is, is that for those of you who are here today, you still have an opportunity to receive Christ and you need to receive him today. That's all I can do for someone who, where there was not any obvious indication that they had received Christ. There's no assurance. There's no certainty that I can say with a believer, they are in, they are now in the arms of Christ. There is nothing that Satan also and his demons can do, no matter how much they want to, to separate us from God's love for us. Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future. That means that there are no circumstances that we face in the present nor in the future, even into eternity, that can separate us from the love of God. Also, this tells us that there are no fears that we might have in the present or worries for the future that should make us doubt his love for us. There is no power on earth or not on earth that can separate us, for God is all-powerful. There is nothing in the sky above or on the earth or under the earth or in all creation that can separate us from the love of God. The conclusion is there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from God's unfailing love. And this is why David says in Psalm chapter 36, verse 7, how priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. For all who come to Jesus, no matter who you are, the Bible says, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast out. But I think it's, it's, it's critical to understand also that it is only in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we have this unfailing love. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It is only in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The unfailing love of God is found only in Christ. And what that means is apart from Jesus, Apart from Christ, we are not able 
to have this love. We are not able to experience this love. Only a true believer is able to experience God's love because only a believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. The Holy Spirit who pours out the love of God within our hearts, often during the times of greatest need, during the times of greatest sorrow. Brothers and sisters, have you experienced this? Which is also a reason why in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, it says, we are able to rejoice in our sufferings. We are able to rejoice in our sufferings. How? Why? Because those are times when we can most experience the love of God. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, two verses later from verses from Romans 5, 3, where it says that, where it says that we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because when we suffer, ultimately what happens is that it res as we come before God, it results in a hope, which is actually an assurance that God does love us, continues to love us, even in our deepest times of suffering. And that's why it says, and hope, this assurance, during those times does not disappoint us. That, that certainty comes to fruition when during those times, God pours out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Only the believers have the Holy Spirit. So only believers can experience the love of God poured out into our hearts. The Holy Spirit also changes our heart so that we are able to respond to God's love by loving him in return, as well as showing God we love him by our obedience to his word. The Holy Spirit not only turns our hearts to God, but also moves us to follow God's word and to obey him. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we see this represented in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, which is a prophecy that, will, that it will occur through faith in Christ, not only for the future future Jews, that God is not finished with the nation of Israel yet, but also applies to every believer of Jesus. He says in Ezekiel 36, 26, meaning there will come a day where I will give you a new heart, a heart of flesh, and put a new spirit in you a new attitude within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, your coldness, your lack of your ignorance toward me and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit, my Holy Spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Who also allows us, helps us to respond, to be able to respond to the love of God. Not only with songs of worship, but also acts of obedience to his word. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And also, of course, and we will look at this more later, Jesus was sacrificed for us. This is another key theme in the entire Bible that shows us God's unfailing love. The ultimate example of God's unfailing love 
is when he gave us his only beloved son to come to earth, to die in our place, when we had no love for him, when we were still his enemies, when we were yet undeserving sinners. It says in Romans 5.8, a verse that many of us are familiar with, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This tells us that God already loved us with an unfailing love when we were against him as his enemies, when we had no love for him, when we did not care about offending him with our disobedience. So if he already loved us with an unfailing love when we were like this, why would he stop loving us or love us less when we are his children? You know, the entire Bible tells us about the unfailing love of God because the entire Bible is about Christ. We see in Luke 24, the account of two followers of Jesus on the way to Emmaus. They were depressed because Jesus, who they had hoped would be the Messiah of promise, had been crucified. But they did not know that he had risen from the dead. And Jesus came and walked beside them in their depression, in their discouragement, in their sorrow. And he said this to them. In Luke 24, 25 to 27, he, meaning Jesus, said to them, how foolish you are. At this point, they did not recognize that it was Jesus. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. When Jesus says Moses and all the prophets, this represents the entire Old Testament. And of course, we know that the New Testament is clearly all about Jesus. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. So we've just seen that that love, God's love, never fails. It never ends. It is eternal. And Paul here is, is giving this and saying this in contrast to spiritual gifts, which will all come to an end. And Paul mentions here, mentions here three of the spiritual gifts, which will all come to an end. The gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of knowledge. And there are Bible commentators and theologians who believe that these three spiritual gifts that Paul mentions here ceased with the early church ceased in the sense that they are no longer expressed today in the way that they were in the early church. This is something that we need to keep in mind. The church at Corinth was still part of the early church. And at that time, the Bible was still being written. The canon was not yet closed. So there was still opportunity for new revelation. There was still opportunity for foretelling of the future because the Bible had not yet been written or had not been finished yet, especially the New Testament. So we need to keep this in mind. But because the Bible is now complete, the biblical canon is now closed. That means all the books in the Bible, the 66 books, are now completed. The Bible is now completed. And the gift of prophecy, 
which before in the early church was not only forthtelling, meaning, meaning proclaiming of God's word, but also included foretelling of the future. The gift of prophecy, therefore, no longer includes the ability of foretelling the future, new information about the future, but rather prophecy is now forthtelling or preaching or proclaiming of God's written word. Tongues, as we hear about them today, are not the same as what we saw in the early church, which was actually the gift of real languages that people could understand, that some people could understand if they spoke that language. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So the tongues in Acts here is, the, is from the Greek word glossa, which is the same word that is used here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. So there isn't any real reason to say that the believers in Corinth were not speaking actual languages when they spoke in tongues. So we need to be very careful about what we are dealing with regarding the so-called tongues of today, which is a string of sounds that are not an intelligible language. Even Mormons who are a cult who do not believe that Jesus is God, who do not believe in salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, but rather believe in salvation through works, claim to be able to speak in tongues, not languages. Tongues are also claimed to, to happen in, in, in paganism, the worship of other gods, shamanism, where you have a witch doctor or a medicine man, or occultism, where they're worshiping demons. There's much that I can say, but the point I want to make is just this. The so-called tongues of today are not necessarily from the Holy Spirit, but could be even from evil spirits or could even be a learned behavior. And also, because the biblical canon is now closed, the spiritual gift of knowledge which included at that time special revelation during the early church is no longer needed. Knowledge, the gift of knowledge is now the Holy Spirit given insight and understanding of the word of God, but not special revelation that is not found in God's word. And the believers in the Corinthian church were focusing on these spiritual gifts. It made them feel prideful, it made them feel better than others if they had them. And they would flaunt them in front of others to a point of chaos in the congregation, where Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 14 that, that they were expressing they were using some of them who had the gift of tongues, the gift of languages at that time, were speaking, and, and, and there, there were people who didn't have the gift. They were just sitting there, and they didn't understand anything that was being said. And Paul, Paul said, You're not, you should be interpreting what they're saying. You know, if you just do this, everyone is just talking and, and people don't understand. You know, not only do you have other believers sitting there not understanding what's being said, he says, even worse, if an unbeliever were to come into the church and see what you're doing and hear what you're doing, they would say, you are out of your mind. That's what he told them. If this is going on, he says, that's why he says, but rather... Use the gift of prophecy, which is still primarily the proclaiming of God's word. No longer foretelling like before, but the proclaiming of God's word. And he says that if you do that, if you use the gift of prophecy when an unbeliever comes in, then he will come under conviction and he will fall down and say, God is surely among you. 
because he understands what you're saying, the word of God. But the way it was going, it was just chaos and there was no love. It made those who didn't have the gift feel terrible. So let me close with 1 Corinthians 13, 9, and we'll pick it up again next time. In 1 Corinthians 13, 9, so, so Paul was telling them, focus rather on that which will never end, which is love, instead of on that which will end, like spiritual gifts. So 1 Corinthians 13, 9, Paul says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. And we will continue looking further at this and, and finish up the chapter next time. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. I think we, we have an idea what the imperfect is. We've seen enough of it, to, uh, of it today, but what is perfection? We'll look at that more next time. But definitely what we will see next time is an emphasis of Paul in telling them, to, telling them that you need to grow up in your perspective on life. You need to mature. You need to grow up in your thinking about what's important. You need to grow up in the way that you live your life. And you need to focus on that which is perfect rather than on that which is imperfect. What does that mean? And how can we be doing that? Next time, we'll be looking and finishing up with that. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father, just describing your unfailing love is not enough. But thank you, Lord, that by grace through faith in Christ, we now have the Holy Spirit who is given to us as a deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance. The spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. The spirit who testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And this, it is, this is the same Holy Spirit who during our times of greatest need, greatest sorrow, pours out the unfailing love of God within our hearts. Oh Lord, I pray that this love that we have from you, that we, of which you have initiated, Lord, that ultimately it drives us not just to worship, but also to action. So, Lord, we commit this time, the rest of this time, into your hands. May you be glorified. Thank you for your great love for us, most of all, in giving us your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.